So hi, everybody. Um, I also wanted to do a quick overview of this week's lab because there's some material in here that isn't heavily covered in class. Um, and I wanted to remind you all that the midterm is not going to explicitly test you on material that is mostly covered in lab. So if something shows up in one of the labs but isn't covered in lecture, it's not going to show up on the midterm. So the rock cycle is what actually, the, so the rock cycle diagrams show how the three types of rock sedimentary rocks made of sediment, igneous rocks, which form from magma, and metamorphic rocks, which form as a result of other rocks being changed by heat and pressure. Rock cycle diagrams show how those three types of rock are related. Most rock does indeed begin as igneous rock with magma cooling at mid-ocean ridges or where you have volcanoes at subduction zones. And some of that igneous rock is converted to metamorphic rock by heat and pressure, while other igneous rocks that are exposed at the surface break down into sediments. And those sediments form sedimentary rocks as the sediments are compacted and turned into rock by pressure, usually once the sedimentary rocks are buried. If the sedimentary rocks are buried deep enough, they will start to be affected by the heat and the pressure of the earth and they will metamorphose and change mineralogy and change texture. And I want to note that we have two types of igneous rocks here. We have extrusive igneous rocks, which are those that form when magma erupts at the surface and becomes lava. And the lava usually cools quite quickly when it's exposed to air or water um, in the case of underwater eruptions. And then you have intrusive igneous rocks where the magma is intruded underground and cools underground where it's warmer because of the heat of the earth. And um, the thing to think about is that rocks don't really break down until they're uplifted. When rocks are underground, they're relatively safe, except for the fact that they'll be, they can be warped by heat and pressure. But as tectonic forces lift them up, like how the rocks that make up the Himalayas were pushed up by continental collision, that exposes the rocks to the elements. It exposes them to um, air and to rainfall, which is what this is trying to show here, and also to gravity. Um, rocks will break down when they're lifted higher up because of gravitational potential energy. And then there's a simpler version of it here that's meant to show you how one type of rock can become another, how igneous rocks can be broken down into sediment, and that sediment will be cemented into sedimentary rocks, and how um, any type of rock can be changed by heat and pressure into a metamorphic rock, including other metamorphic rocks. So any questions so far? I've talked a fair bit about subduction zones in this class, and um, a subduction zone is one feature that can form at a convergent plate boundary, and as long you'll get subduction as long as one of the plates coming together has oceanic crust. Um, subduction zones create continental crust by melting. You have, um, you have these sediments in the downgoing plate helping to melt the bit of mantle wedged between the two plates. And that creates magma that rises up and forms either intrusive igneous rocks underneath, underneath Earth's surface um, or extrusive igneous rocks if the magma actually makes it all the way to Earth's surface. And this also sort of shows you how you have, um, how sedimentary rocks can, can get turned into metamorphic rocks, how, um, how, sediment, how sedimentary rocks in the downgoing plates can be converted to metamorphic rocks as the heat and pressure go up. Um, and also how eventually when these magmas cool into igneous rocks, they will be, the igneous rocks at the surface will be broken down by wind and water and sometimes glaciers as well. And they'll be trans, the sediments will be transported to basins like lakes or oceans where they'll be deposited and where they will over time lithify into sedimentary rocks. And one thing to consider with sedimentary rocks is that you get different types of sedimentary rocks forming in different depositional environments, which is something I alluded to a little bit in class. How different sediments, how you get different sediments in a deep ocean versus those that you get in a river. And that's something I'll talk about on one of the upcoming slides. And I just have this animation in here again to show you that you do have, you have sediment being dragged down and that um, both causes the sediments to be metamorphosed. And it also brings water into this mantle wedge and helps it melt.
Now, um, the depth at which igneous rocks are cooling affects which affects whether the igneous rocks are going to have large crystals or small crystals. Igneous rocks that cool at the surface or underwater are going to cool very quickly because of the exposure to the air or the water. And the less, the, the, the more time that crystals have to cool, the larger they're going to be. So magmas that cool underground where it's warmer due to the heat of the earth will tend to have larger crystals. They'll tend to be known as coarse grained rocks because you can actually see the individual crystals and tell them apart from one another with the naked eye. Whereas rocks resulting from extrusive eruptions like most volcanic rocks have tiny crystals that you can't easily tell apart without using a microscope because the crystals are tiny because they didn't have much time to cool. And you can see that with some different types of igneous rocks. There actually are igneous rocks that cool so quickly that you don't have any crystals at all and you just get glass. So this is, um, what type of rock is this? This is probably one that some of you are familiar with a little, at least a little bit. Also known as volcanic glass. Obsidian? Yes, precisely. This is obsidian. Um, and that's an igneous rock that doesn't actually have any minerals in it because the magma cools so quickly that crystals don't have time to grow. Um, now, for igneous rocks that take a little bit more time to cool, like the when it's not just flash cooled, you will still get some crystals in them, but they will be really tiny so that the rock surface itself looks really smooth. Um, and those are known as aphanitic or fine grained igneous rocks. Coarse grained igneous rocks or phaneritic igneous rocks have the crystals actually visible. They may not be huge, but you can see them. You can tell apart this black mineral from this white mineral, and you can you can look you can look with your you can look with a hand lens or with a mic with a magnifier and see that there is see that there's individual crystal faces. Like you can you can pick apart different crystals here. Um, occasionally you get really big crystals and those are known as a pegmatitic texture, which is something the lab doesn't really go into. Um, you also get one fascinating texture where you have you'll have crystals starting to cool in an underground magma chamber. And then suddenly everything in the magma chamber gets expelled to the surface and the the large crystals have already cooled but the remaining magma gets cooled really rapidly, quenched all of a sudden. And so you have a rock that has large crystals from when they were starting to cool underground. And then they're surrounded by small crystals that you can't see easily because that's from when the rest of the magma was rapidly cooled at the surface. You also sometimes have igneous rocks that have a vesicular texture that have holes in them because the magma had a lot of gas and the holes are formed by the escaping gas. So any questions about this so far? Something else to consider is that you have minerals of different colors um, that cool or melt in a given order. Um, the darker minerals in igneous rocks are stable at higher temperatures and they form from the magma first. You get the green olivine and then black minerals like pyroxene and amphibole and biotite. And those will cool along with a variety of the mineral plagioclase that is more rich in calcium earlier than the rest of the minerals do. Um, the minerals that as the as the rock starts as the as the rock starts to cool you will start getting minerals that are lighter in color forming you'll get minerals that have more silica in them and less iron and magnesium forming like quartz um the more sodium rich version of plagioclase feldspar and you'll notice that um, on this branch, you have the two types of plagioclase, the calcium rich version and the sodium rich version. The calcium rich version is darker. So the sodium rich version crystallizes later. Um, you get this pink mineral, which is um, considered to be a light colored or felsic mineral. Um, and then the light colored mica and quartz. Um, and quartz forms last usually. Quartz is the last mineral to form or to cool. and not so coincidentally, if you start to melt a rock, it will be the first rock to melt. And this has a lot to do with what elements dominate. 
quartz is simply silica dioxide and silica melts rather easily. The mafic minerals have a lot more iron and magnesium in them and it, um, iron and magnesium stay solid at pretty high temperatures. So you need to really, you need to really turn the temperature up a lot to melt, to melt the, the mafic minerals in a rock. And that's actually one reason why continental crust is more felsic and more dominated by light colored minerals, because the temperature at subduction zones isn't really all that high. It's high enough to produce a magma that has the ingredients to make quartz and feldspars, but not much in the way of making mafic minerals like olivine and pyroxene. So that's why granite, which is the main rock that makes up continental crust, is pretty light colored and it's also not very dense. It's mostly made of silica, which is less dense than iron and magnesium. And this is a little bit more in depth than, in, than what you'll have to do on the lab, but it's kind of a reference to show you how mineral color relates to melting and cooling temperatures. Moving on to sedimentary rocks, their characteristics largely have to do with what sort of environment they were de deposited in. And that has nothing to do with where they are deposited, with where they are now. In Antarctica, for example, we have rocks that are now sitting in an icy wasteland, but we can infer that they were deposited in lagoons or deposited in forests or deposited in warm, shallow ocean water, but they are now found on land and they're found in a cold, desolate landscape as a result of uplift and climate change. But we can still infer what the climate and depositional environment were like from looking at the sedimentary rocks, as well as the structures in them or the fossils in them. And this helps us reconstruct what Antarctica's environment has looked like in past times. So this is just an example of a couple different types of depositional environment. You get different sediments deposited in a lagoon that you do um, on a lake that's on land. You also get these alluvial fan deposits where you have a desert where there isn't much water to carry the sediment. And so sediment just piles up at the foot of a mountain. Um, and ultimately most sediment ends up in the ocean. Most sediment ends up being carried to the ocean and ends up in these submarine fans at the base of the continental slope um, in the deep ocean basins themselves. But some sediment ends up in lakes or just in these desert alluvial fans instead. And a lot of the textures of sedimentary rocks have to do with the speed and sometimes with the temperature of the water in which the sediments were deposited. Sediments can also be moved about by wind or they can be carried by glaciers, but the most important medium of transportation for sediments is often liquid water. And this chart summarizes the different sorts of rocks and structures you might expect from rocks that form in different depositional environments. So for example, a river channel in which the water is moving pretty fast is going to be carrying boulders and pebbles and sand and mud. So it's going to be very poorly sorted and it's going to have some pretty large particles in it. Um, and you'll form conglomerates that have pebbles in them as well as sandstones and shale. However, in a lake where the water is moving much less quickly, you'll still have mud and sand, but you won't have as many boulders and pebbles. And so you'll get shale and sandstone, but no conglomerate. You won't have the rock that has the larger grains in them. Um, in beaches, you'll have wave action does a really good job of sorting the sand. So you'll have these, you'll have, depending on how fast the waves move, you'll have a mix of sandstone and then some conglomerate and shale. Out in the deep ocean where there isn't much wave action, you'll mostly have shale, which is made of mud, which has tiny grains and thus can be carried by really slow moving water. You'll also have some chemical, oops, that was my cat jumping on the keyboard. You'll also have some chemical sediments like limestone made of calcium carbonate and made largely um, by organisms that live in, that live in warm water. Um, and this is, this chart is, this is, so this is from the, the, the slide set that the TA has made from you, made for you. And this is kind of a little guide you can use to figure out what types of rocks are going to be more common in different depositional environments. I also wanted to note that you can sometimes help figure out, you can sometimes help yourself figure out what place a sediment is from by looking at the fossils. Um, deep rocks that form in um, deep marine environments are often going to have fossils of marine creatures in them. Any questions so far?
I also mentioned sorting. So sedimentary rocks are largely classified by their grain size. Um, conglomerate is um, conglomerate is made of it's a rock that's made of sediments where there's pebble-sized sediments mixed in or gravel-sized sediments. You have sandstone that's largely made of sand-sized particles, and you have shale, which is made of which is made of really tiny particles, the really fine-grained particles that you get in mud. You can also classify sedimentary rocks and sediments by their shape, by how rounded they are. More rounded sediments are going to have been transported more because the edges will have been ground down by water. And sorting refers to whether you have sediments that are all the same size or whether there's a mix of sizes. And faster water is usually going to lead to more poorly sorted sediments because fast water sort of carries everything with it. It's also, if a sediment is poorly sorted, that's also a good indicator that it hasn't been in the system for very long. The more time sediments spend in a system like a water system, the more they will be sorted by grain size. So by the time that rivers meet the ocean, the sediments being deposited by them are usually quite well sorted. They've lost all of their gravel, they've probably lost most of the sand, and so you get a sediment that is mostly just that is mostly just clay and silt sized particles, not a mix of clay, silt, sand, and gravel. So that's sort of a crash course introduction to sedimentary rocks. I have a few slides on metamorphic rocks, but any questions about this? As for metamorphic rocks, they are formed when pre-existing rocks get changed in regards to their texture or their mineral composition by heat and pressure. And the this usually happens from rocks being buried deep enough, but it can also happen from incidents like magma coming into contact with another rock and causing what's known as contact metamorphism. Um, for this lab, the main thing you're gonna wanna be focusing on is degree of metamorphism. Metamorphic rocks are sorted by grade, and at higher temperatures and pressures, they are metamorphosed more. They exhibit more dramatic mineral change and also exhibit um, noticeable distortion. So the a lot of a lot of the sedimentary rocks we study, or excuse me, a lot of the metamorphic rocks that we study result from sedimentary rocks being buried or compressed in the case of continental collision. And in Antarctica, we actually have quite a few metamorphic rocks that are from mountain building events, from where ocean sediments got caught up between two masses of continent and squeezed, and the pressure from squeezing turned them into new metamorphic rocks. So shale is a sedimentary rock that usually forms, it often forms in marine environments. It forms as ocean floor mud, basically. Now, shale to begin with, um, it's just kind of these little beds of mud. Under a little more pressure or low grade metamorphism, it will start to turn into slate where you start getting micas growing. You start getting new mineral growth, but it's very hard to see. But slate does exhibit platy cleavage that's different from shale. As the slate gets metamorphosed more, it'll turn into schist um, in which you start having in which you start seeing the micas much more and in which you can, in which the rock is shiny noticeably. Um, if schist gets metamorphosed even more, you'll get nice. And nice is when you get the nice, when you get the cool banding of black and white minerals like you saw in some of the Antarctic pictures I showed. And that black and white banding as, as a result of really high pressures because that causes the minerals to separate as they grow um, to be more stable. And the TA has also included a couple of tidbits here that might be useful for this. Um, you want to remember that, that fundamentally most of the rocks we're studying are made of silica. Um, the mafic rocks still do have silica. The mafic igneous rocks or the dark colored igneous rocks still do have silica in them, but they have more iron and magnesium and that does affect their composition for a bit. And rocks that are mafic will still have some lighter colored minerals in them, just not as many, and they will be much more heavily dominated by dark colored minerals. True felsic rocks have very, very few mafic or dark colored minerals at all. And they also included this, they also included this 
nice little this nice little analogy for metamorphic rocks. The rocks are basically being squeezed under pressure. So thanks for sticking around for that. I will be uploading this. Good luck with the lab as well as with the midterm exam. And I will see at least some of you on Wednesday when I'll go over the lab material one more time and also have a fun little breather lecture of sorts. So thank you for coming by and I will see you soon.